From beekeepers to basketball players, from songwriters to famous historians, it really feels like on Harder Poland I've interviewed everybody. But it turns out I was wrong. We haven't yet talked about quantum computing. Well, I'm going to talk to a American whiz kid with Polish roots who's making Poland the home of quantum computing and has some madcap ideas about how awesome Poland is as a place to live in. Dom Andrzejczyk, thank you very much for coming to the studio to Heart of Poland. Thanks very much for having me, Patty. You came to my attention in a video which has caught a lot of other people's attention about why you left California to come to Poland. So let's maybe start there. What's the backstory here? Why did some crazy American, admittedly with Polish roots, decide to make his way to Poland of all places, as you said at the start of that video? <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it really was, um, so I, I have a background in physics and engineering, um, and I was a software developer for basically my entire career. And um, if you're, I don't know if you've written any software before, if you've used any, <laughs> any of the tools. I can confirm I have not. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's, a, uh, there's a, an open source repository called GitHub. It's where everybody submits all of their you know, open source or closed source projects. Um, and as a developer, you know, I would pull some of these projects and you would see the contributors and the authors. And I was always blown away by how many Polish last names there were in the contributors list. And, and it wasn't like, you know, uh, occasionally you'd come across like an example, but no, it was, it was constantly. And, and I always thought to myself, I'm like, you know, what's going on over there? Is it, are they Polish Americans or are they all Poles that are over there? And, um, you know, you click on the profiles and it's like, you know, Gliwice, Kraków, Warsaw. Um, and so in around 2013, um, when I was still living in California, I would spend maybe like, you know, a month, two weeks here in Warsaw. And just as sort of like an exploratory mission to see what was going on. And from 2013 all the way up until 2016, I would say 2016 where I was like, yeah, you know, it's about time for me to start thinking about leaving this place and coming here because I had moved to San Francisco in 2010. And I remember sort of those early days of the Silicon Valley where things were still, I mean, it was growing and it already re it hit that inflection point uh, where it was experiencing extreme growth. This was pre-Facebook IPO, pre-Twitter IPO. Um, but I also felt that energy here and I thought to myself, well, geez, you know, maybe it's a good idea to jump on this boat before it sets sail because then it's going to be too late. So primarily my motivation was actually for economic reasons. Mm. I get the impression sometimes that Poles and particularly Polish tech, well, they make great employees, not so great at being employers and actually growing businesses and going beyond, say, a mid cap size and then, and then going global. And there aren't that many of those kind of Polish companies with a couple of exceptions. Uh, it, do you think that's a, a pretty accurate description? Is that is that is that because they make such good employees or is there something else going on here? No. Um, so I, I think that they do make uh, great leaders and great entrepreneurs and Polish society is very entrepreneurial. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the history here, given the fact that, um, you know, there was almost 300 years of occupation. Poles had to get very creative as to how to survive um, and sort of maintain that national identity. And um, but the problem that Poland has, it's, it's both a blessing and a curse because Poland is about 40 million people. That's a large market, but it's not a massive market. And Polish is only spoken in really, actually two places in the world, Chicago and Poland. <laughs> and London, I have to say, I've used and Polish London. a lot in London. <laughs> and the north of Scotland, you can find a pole everywhere, just like an Irish pub. Uh, but that's true, yes, yeah, Chicago is the place. Yeah, yeah, and, and so, so you have a large enough market where you can make a very large business. Um, and you do have a lot of you know, really successful businesses here in Poland, but they, they're kind of stuck in Poland because they planted their flag here and they decided, okay, we're gonna, you know, this is gonna be our beachhead market. And then maybe at some point we'll move to the UK, to the US. Um, but that step usually never happens because it's very difficult to sort of change course and change momentum uh, once you've established a large enough business. And so I wouldn't say that they're, you know, preferably better employees than they are employers. I think it's because they get trapped in this sort of, you know, hey, let's start in Poland mentality. Mm -hmm. And then they get stuck in that mentality because then if they have investors, they have to make sure that they're 
improving their bottom line. Now, I imagine as you're sipping over your chai latte in, in whatever coffee shop you are in San Francisco or somewhere in, on the West Coast and telling your friends that you're going to move to Poland, their first reaction is, what the heck? Uh, probably they know nothing about the country, I imagine, because Poland doesn't have a big uh, cultural reputation abroad, is my opinion at least. Uh, and then they probably associate it with cold, grey, boring. And you released a video to try and sort of counteract some of those facts. Uh, were, did they have that reaction? Or, or, or <laughs> were they surprised? Or did they support you? Yeah, so, so I mean, most of them were just sort of like, all right, whatever. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> they're happy to see you go, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them probably. <laughs> um, but no, actually, um, I, I, there, were, there were a couple of investors that I met, uh, one of them being Marvin Lau. Shout out to Marvin. Um, he, that, that first trip here to, to Warsaw, um, Marvin was already sort of looking at the, you know, looking at the whole ecosystem, you know, and Marvin's not Polish, uh, Marvin's an American. And um, he's always been sort of on Team Poland for a very, very long time. And when I told him that I was going to be making these trips out here during the summer, he's like, let me put you in touch with everybody that I know. Um, so, you know, Marvin was kind of validation. Um, I had another friend, Farouk, uh, who was also very interested in, uh, in the Polish ecosystem. And they all knew that it was, Poland was not yet at that inflection point, but they were watching very closely. And so you're right. M most people were like, Poland, eh, whatever, behind the Iron Curtain. Like, you know, the, the image that they have, I'm sure, is just like these, those old apartment blocks, you know, from the 70s, and that's pretty much it. Um, but, um, and, and, and Poland, I think, also has a bit of a uh, PR problem. Um, they, it's funny because in the video I talk about the fact that Polish founders are usually engineers. And so by virtue of that, they kind of don't really know, know how to do the sales and marketing. And it's also sort of the same with Poland in general. Like Poland doesn't really know how to market itself very well. Um, and uh, and it was funny. I was actually reading a comment earlier today on the on the YouTube page where somebody was like, you know, this guy did more in nine minutes than <laughs> <laughs> than all, all of all of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the last twenty years. Uh, well, let's. Uh, I've had that comment as well. Tom, I have to say, but <laughs> probably uh, probably it's just someone wanting to be nice rather than criticizing our good old friends in the Ministry of Finance and uh, Foreign Affairs. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's imagine that Poland was one of your business projects. How would you rewrite the code for Poland marketing? What would you like to see? What do you think might even get into American hearts and minds? Let's say mm. just treat that country. So yeah, it's a crowded marketplace. You know, not many countries have a lot of soft power footprint uh, and uh, it's quite hard to break through especially in today's global social media world where anyone could be everywhere and we're, we're citizens of everywhere mm. what would you do yeah well what I'm actually doing right now is I'm trying to uh, so I have many many Polish American friends back home and they all work they're all very very successful and they all work as you know either in banking or in finance or you know sales marketing and um, I mean, they're, they're more Americans than they are Polish, but they do have that you know, strong Polish identity. And, and I keep telling them, like, guys, you have no idea how massive of an opportunity there is here to really take advantage of these hard technical skills. You could come here with all of your experience that you have from the West and maybe not necessarily start a business, but go work for a small company and help them get their sales and marketing on track. You guys have access to markets here in the West, why not take advantage of all of this amazing talent and, and really sort of help the society to realize their true potential? Because ultimately, when you, you, you have sort of all of the ingredients here you, you need to make really successful companies. Um, and you know, Estonia is actually, I think, a, a really good example. Estonia has more unicorns per capita than even Silicon Valley. And Estonia has 1.2 or 1.3 million people living in the entire country. That's like the Warsaw metropolitan area. Um, and so because Estonia is more or less very similar in history to Poland, with, except for the fact that they're not cursed with this giant market, um, all of this is possible. Um, the, only, the only missing ingredient that we need to add into this stew is just that sales and marketing bit. Um, and I, and you know, I, I keep meeting um, founders here in Poland all the time that have just incredible technology. 
it's just it's just not marketed properly. They they either don't know how to sell it or they don't know how to communicate it or they communicate it too much like an engineer where it's like here are all the features. Features and benefits. Yeah, features with benefits. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so you're saying to these polls uh, or, or second or third generation polls in the US and the UK and other places like polls come home. Yeah. It's a, it's a pretty strong call. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Come home because, I mean, let's face it. I mean, we've, we've, we've lost about 20 million um, polls over the last 50 or 60 or 70 years um, or, or rather 20 million 20 million individuals with some sort of Polish roots live abroad. Um, and that could be Polish like Polish like me or you know somebody who just recently left Poland. Um, but 20 that's, that's half of the population. Even if we can get 10% of those people back, although that's, that's a massive, massive, massive undertaking, um, you know you have two million highly skilled individuals that come back here, and sure, those first couple of years are going to be difficult. Um, but you know, anything worth doing is is difficult. Dom, this brings me to a point where we have to. I have to get a bit uncomfortable, uh, which I don't try not to do in uh, interviews. So we're going to talk about quantum computing <laughs> uh, just for a little bit. Now, I, I read some Wikipedia about quantum computing. I can't say that I've read uh, uh, or understood a lot of it by the time I've finished. <laughs> You're all quite into quantum computing, aren't you? And, it, and you have some madcap plan to be the first ever quantum computer to uh, Poland. I understand. Is that right? That's correct. Let's talk a little bit more about it, and please be kind to me and any <laughs> other viewer who doesn't necessarily know the ins and outs of uh, this crazy world. Sure, sure. Well, quantum computing, uh, it's a new computing platform that's based on quantum physics instead of classical physics. Um, the reason why you want a computing platform that's based on quantum physics is because nature itself is quantum. Nature is not classical. So when you go to the subatomic level, when you look at molecules and the way that the electrons are interacting with the valence shells of those molecules, um, you, you actually cannot to some degree simulate that to a high degree of accuracy on a classical computer. Um, so for example, like we will never really fully understand how photosynthesis works in plants given the fact that the process that's happening in photosynthesis is quantum mechanical. We can't do that on a classical computer. So a quantum computer promises us a future where we can build far better organic photovoltaic cells that mimic photosynthesis. And so it will bring on a, a new quantum age. Um, so, and, and quantum computing has really been in the realm of science fiction for you know, 30, 40 years. But we're actually at a point now where uh, devices are coming online. Uh, they're not yet production ready, but you know, in the next five to 10 years, they will be. Um, so my, my fund, Atmos Ventures, we invested in a company in, in the UK, actually. It was a spin out from Oxford University. And they developed a ion trap quantum computer. Um, prior to that, uh, I have heard about that in Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> I think it's the thing that they used to get Darth Vader at the end. Uh, uh, I, no, I don't I even think that was there. an ion thruster. <laughs> <laughs> He's so good, he even knows the thing from Star Wars that I was trying to reference. Good, good. Okay, let's carry on. <laughs> yeah, um, and so uh, I mean, the the whole backstory about why. Why I, I really like quantum is, is um, I mean, I studied physics at university. I've heard about quantum computers at university. I, I did my, uh, my thesis in quantum computing. Um, and I remember then it was just so difficult to find any information on it because it was still science fiction. Um, then when I started working for uh, this uh, venture capital fund in Palo Alto, uh, we invested in the first gate-based quantum computing startup called Rigetti. And it was from that point that I just started absorbing everything that you know this company was doing, what they were building, the mistakes that they made, um, and they hit a few uh, they hit a few roadblocks in terms of their product development. Uh, turns out that building a quantum computer is really hard. You don't say. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, but then but then but when I saw the, the some of the errors that they made. Um, I thought to myself, well, I'll just invest in the next generation of quantum computers and pick the one that addresses some of the issues that this, this first company encountered. So we invested in Oxford Ionics. Um, we also invested in a company called Orca Computing. So one is an uh, ion trap quantum computer. The other one uses photonics, so light beams of light to use qubits. Qubits, of course, being the, um, the elementary unit of measurement in a quantum computer. So where you have bits on a classical computer, zeros and ones, 
you have qubits in a quantum computer. And what a qubit is, is it can be a zero, it can be a one, or it can be zero and one at the same time because it has those strange <sighs> properties of quantum physics, of superposition, and, um, and that's what really makes the quantum computer very powerful. Um, so, you know, we're, we're at a stage now where we invested in the company, was it about a year and a half ago? Um, they've developed their sort of first version of uh, their prototype. And one of the, uh, I met this professor here when I first moved to Poland, who was actually building these control systems for these quantum computers in Oxford. Um, and the control systems are actually as important as the quantum computer itself. Because in order to talk to a quantum computer, you need to take a classical signal, have that classical signal translated into a quantum signal. This quantum signal goes to the quantum computer. The quantum computer then runs its calculations, returns some sort of output that's quantum. You have to retranslate that quantum signal into a classical signal, and then the classical signal goes back to your computer. So. So, sounds like me trying to talk to the Siri on my phone. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, never works. It doesn't seem to get my accent. So uh, I see it works there. So uh, if I was there, uh, so so hang on. So so we're going to see one of these madcap science fiction computers in Poland. Yeah. And to what end? What would it be used for? What, have you got some kind of a goal for the particular computer itself when it's going to be here in Poland? Well, right now, just it's it's purely research and development um, because you know there there isn't a quantum computer yet that is fully working and that's in production that's doing anything useful. Um, so sort of the first stage is we need to take these, uh, these control systems and we need to make them better. Because if you want to have the best quantum computer, you have to be able to control your qubits to a very, very high level of precision. Um, and the technology has been here in Poland for many, many, many years. Um, so Grzegorz Kasprowicz, uh, he's, uh, he's an adjunct professor at the, uh, at the Polytechnical University of Warsaw. Um, he spent a lot of time at CERN working on the Large Hadron Collider and the Higgs boson experiment. Uh, and he built this technology there at CERN. He came back and then it turned out, oh, well actually this is great for controlling qubits. Um, and so he started selling his devices to uh, University of Oxford, University of Innsbruck. Uh, NIST, University of Maryland, um, the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, so, I mean, this thing is used, um, you know, globally. So going back to what I had said originally where, you know, some of the best technology is actually here in Poland, it's just nobody knows about it. I mean, this is, this is a prime example of that. Yeah. I'm kind of getting excited as you're saying this because it sounds like the next Silicon Valley is going to be a quantum valley and it sounds like with a little bit of luck and a bit of elbow grease it might be here in Poland. Very much so, yeah. Okay, I'm kind of, I still want to see what a, I want to see what, can I touch it? It's, no, no, we'll worry about that <laughs> later. Uh, okay, what do you not like about Poland, Dom? There must be some things that have got on your wick and it can't just be that the weather might not be quite the same as on the west coast of America. Mm. Um... You know, something that um, I think actually even a lot of Poles complain about, well, actually really Poles do complain a lot. Uh, <laughs> so maybe we'll, we'll start there. Um, it's, people are still quite pessimistic. And um, the uphill battle is sort of convincing them or trying to be sort of an advocate of optimism. Um, and I don't blame them. Um, you know, we, it hasn't been an easy, you know, 300 years. And so it's very, it's very easy to just sort of fall into that pessimistic mode where it's like, oh, everything is hopeless and oh, we shouldn't even try. Um, but, you know, I was watching the Elliot Kipchoge uh, documentary uh, earlier this uh, week. The marathon runner. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, God, I'm going to butcher the quote, but he said, he said that happiness, in order to be happy, you have to have happy thoughts. And in order to have happy thoughts you need to actually try to have those happy thoughts. So it's actually, so you have to work on it. Like it's not, oh, everything is amazing and everybody's happy. Well, no, it's, 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 uh, it's a lot of work to be optimistic all the time. And, you know, there's, uh, I forget who the director was, but he even said that um, when he's shooting a, when he's shooting a dystopian movie, he likes to go shoot in Eastern Europe because, <laughs> 
the people there are already sort of in this, you know, <laughs> mode where everybody's depressed, where it makes sort of for great extras. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. Well, it's not the first time on Heart to Pony we've heard that uh, 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 comment. <laughs> if I was a Polish business and I thought I was really awesome, could I get in touch with you, Dom, and see whether you we might be able to do business together? And what kind of business would I be to maybe fit with the portfolio of companies that you would invest in? Yeah, so, um, so Atmos Ventures, we're a deep tech fund. Um, so we like uh, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, robotics, automation. Um, so really, any company that has part that, ha that has some kind of very defensible technology that they're using, uh, you know, either on their application. So it could be software, uh, or it could be hardware. Uh, but we usually like to see projects coming from academia, where they're not yet commercialized, but they're looking for a partner to help them commercialize and to see if you know there's some sort of product market fit. Mm, I imagine there's quite a lot of untapped potential in those Polish universities out there. Oh yeah. Well, it sounds like me and Don won't be doing any business together because I don't fulfill any of those categories. Don, we've just got time to sneak in Paddy's quickfire round, so I'm okay. going to give you a few quickfire questions. Didn't prep you at all. Uh, favorite place in Poland? Favorite place in Poland? Zakopane. Interesting. Uh, place in Poland you haven't visited yet, but really should. Hmm. Rzeszów. Interesting. Uh, Szczecin usually comes out uh, top of that list. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite Polish food? My, uh, my. I don't, I don't know if this is like a regional thing or not, but my, um, my mom used to make something called baba. I don't know if you know what that is. It's not babka. It's not the cake. No, uh, no, no. It's basically like uh, you know, uh, uh, kiszka ziemniaczana. I do. That's not my favorite. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's something like that, except it's more sort of like in a in a um, like a, in a in a sheet. It's basically like you know you you bake it and then you have this giant French fry, you know, and you eat it with sour cream and it's it's very much comfort food. Yeah. It's, Incredibly unhealthy, but every once in a you, while. You look like you could easily fit a couple of those in, <laughs> uh, no problem whatsoever. If you had to be locked inside a prison cell, mm -hmm. uh, obviously for a nice white collar type crime, uh, with any living or dead pole, who would okay. it be? You're going to be together for quite a long time, 23 hours a day, so choose wisely. Stanisław Ulam. Uh, who was? Oh, uh, he, was a, he was a very famous mathematician. Mathematician, physicist. Um, he... Uh, he, he, he was actually uh, part of the um, Manhattan Project, oh. or at least the early stages of the Manhattan Project, so working on splitting the atom. Uh, very, very brilliant man, uh, incredibly underrated. Not many people have heard of him. Wow, I get the impression if I put my finger into Dom's ear, I'd probably, it would probably steam would come out and I'd probably burn myself. It sounds like a lot of machines are operating at, if not quantum level, then, uh, then certainly fast. I'm probably quite grateful I'm not locked up in that prison cell with him and uh, Stanislaw <laughs> Worm, because I wouldn't have too much to say. But I think it's been a fascinating discussion. We've talked a lot about the subjects which it, it captured me when I saw that video. Uh, we'll see if we can post a link to it underneath. Uh, I think, what, where's, where, how many views have you got now, Dom, bearing in mind that your, can your channel had almost no subscribers when you put this video out and it yeah. seems it, it's gone crazy it's like tens of thousands basically of people who watch this film yeah. pretty pretty impressive for a <laughs> for a newbie youtube i'm not jealous obviously <laughs> uh, but uh we'll just see if we can put that underneath this video so people can watch it it's absolutely been a, it's been a pleasure having you here maybe we'll invite you back on another time to talk uh, when you've got your little quantum sounds uh, good we'll do the cu update qubit machine in, in uh, the, the box or wherever you, wherever you keep it so thank you very much for watching this episode of heart of poland throughout the course of this show we're now on over 110 episodes we've talked to interesting people doing interesting things and i think you'll agree that today's guest is really doing some interesting things and his verve and enthusiasm for poland is quite frankly captivating if you'd like to share this episode i'd be grateful for you to pass it on but you can also watch many of the other episodes of hearts of poland on whichever social media platform you find or you can visit the firstnews.com which is of course the to use uh, a word that don might use premier english language site for news about poland so i'll see you again for another episode of Hearts of Poland.